Good evening. I think we could do a little bit better than that. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Happy Friday, TGIF, and welcome to Focus. Focus, which was founded in 2021 and sponsored by the Office Dean of Undergraduate Students, and whose name and mission derives from ideologies from the great Toni Morrison, is an interdisciplinary initiative designed to bring anti-racist scholarship, thought, and action in every part of university life. And with that being said, my name is Eric Appleton. I'm the Residential Life Coordinator over at Butler College, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our two very special guests this evening. We have Dr. Chris Gillard, if you could help me give him a round of applause. Thank you. Dr. Gillard is a Just Tech Fellow and at, at the sorry uh, Social Science Research Council. Uh, his concentration includes digital privacy, surveillance, and the intersections of race, class, and technology. He advocates for critical and equity-focused approaches to tech and education, and recently has been found inside of the Washington Post and other works such as the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Educause, Review, Vice, Real Life Magazine, Wired, and The Atlantic. Our second guest is Professor Ruha Benjamin. We could give her a round of applause as well. She specializes in the interdisciplinary study of science, medicine, technology, race, ethnicity, gender, knowledge, and power. She is the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab and author of three books, one of which undergrads will receive today, Virtual Justice, as well as race after technology, people finance, and was the people people science, sorry, and was the author and editor of Captivating Technology. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Chris Gilliard and Ruha Benjamin. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me okay? Lovely. I am going to kick things off with a short primer just to get our mental juices flowing, and then I'll turn things over um, and have a, a conversation with my wonderful colleague, Chris, who I'm so excited is here, and then we'll open things up for a little Q&A with all of you. All right, so the reason why I'm so excited to welcome Chris is because his work is really foundational to a growing tech justice movement. And although we've had a lot of exchanges online, this is the first time we're actually getting a chance to meet in person. So thank you to the Office of Dean of Undergraduate Studies for making this gathering possible. I always think it's important to ground our discussion of race and technology historically so that we understand the work we're doing today is part of a longer black freedom tradition of scholars, artists, organizers, who are thinking critically and creatively about the role of technology in our lives. Before any of us were even born, this tradition was underway. We build on their work. Whether we're talking about MLK's warning that, quote, when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered or whether we're talking about Octavia E. Butler's insistence that all struggle are essentially power struggles. Who will rule? Who will lead? Who will define, refine, conf confine, design? Who will dominate? She's making this connection for us between designing and dominating the world. Or Amiri Baraka, who, by the way, was born in Newark, New Jersey, and served as poet laureate of New Jersey before he died. Back in 1969, Baraka wrote an essay called Technology and Ethos, which some of my students here already know very well, which I encourage all of us to study and read. You can download it for free online. For our purposes this evening, I'll share a very short excerpt from this essay. Nothing has to look or function the way it does. The West man's freedom unscientifically got at the expense of the rest of the world's people has allowed him to expand his mind, spread his sensibility wherever it could go, and so shape the world and its powerful artifact engines. 
Political power, he says, is also the power to create. Not only what you will, but to be free to go wherever you can go. Black creation, creation powered by the black ethos, brings very special results. Think of yourself, black creator, freed of European restraint, which first means the restraint of self-determined mind development. Think what would be the results of the unfettered blood inventor creator with the resources of a nation behind him to imagine, to think, to construct, to energize. How do you communicate with the great masses of black people? How do you use the earth to feed the masses of people? How do you cure illness? How do you prevent illness? What are the black purposes of space travel? A typewriter, why should it only make use of the tips of the fingers as contact points of flowing multi-directional creativity? If I invented a word-placing machine, he writes, an expression scriber, if you will, then I would have a kind of instrument into which I could step and sit or, or sprawl or hang and use not only my fingers to make words express feelings, but elbows, feet, head, behind, and all the, all the sounds I wanted, screams, grunts, taps, itches, I'd have magnetically recorded at the same time and translated into word, or perhaps even the final expressed thought feeling would not be merely word or sheet, but itself, the expression, three-dimensional, able to be touched or tasted or felt or entered or heard or carried, like a speaking, singing, constantly communicating charm. A typewriter is corny. <laughs> Most of that West-shaped information is like mud and sand when you're panning for gold. Freed of an oppressor, but also, as Toure has reminded, we must be free from the oppressor's spirit as well. It is this spirit as emotional construct that can manifest as expression, as art, or technology, or any form. But what is our spirit? What will it project? What machines will it produce? What will they achieve? What will be their morality? Though written in 1969, this excerpt from Technology and Ethos raises questions still relevant to any discussion of race and technology today. Building on this tradition of black freedom fighters, artists, organizers, I'll offer three quick provocations of my own before opening things up for conversation. First, racism is productive. Not in the sense of being good, the normative sense, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We are still taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods, outdated, rather than innovative, systemic, diffuse an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, productive. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Second, we have to reckon with how race and technology shape one another. Because more and more people are accustomed to thinking and talking about the social and ethical impacts of technology. But that's only half the story. Social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, <laughs> which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize. 
Imagination is a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, about profit, about control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination where we have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside, that is, who these systems harm, but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desires even, that many people have for social domination. And perhaps even more importantly, alongside our critique, we should ask ourselves, if not this death-making tool, then what? What will we create? What will we create? What will we create in the tradition of Baraka and others? With that, please join me in welcoming my wonderful friend, colleague, Professor Gilliard. Thank you so much for that. Of course, of yeah, course. It's amazing. So I, I always like to start these kind of conversations with a backstory, how we got here, what motivates us of all of the things that we could work on in our lives, what brought you to this nexus of issues, whether personal, professional? So um, the story I always tell, I grew up, I'm from Detroit, and uh, I grew up in Detroit in the, in the 70s. And so people who are familiar with some of the recent events, say the murder of, of Tyree Nichols, mm -hmm. will um, have heard of Scorpion. Well, we had a similar unit called Stress. And stress stood for um, stop the robberies, enjoy safe streets. Mm. In about the two and a half years they operated, they killed 22 people, 21 of whom were black. And a big part of that was um, surveillance and, you know, um, going into communities, posing as victims, yeah. and then murdering people who they encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Detroit with all the other things you think about with Detroit, um, white flight and, you know, post-industry industry. But I grew up in Detroit under the specter of stress. Yeah. And so that's always kind of colored how I think about, um, about technology yeah. and about race and about policing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, what brought me here, here <laughs> is, is sort of like an accident. I mean, I, uh, I've, I've, found myself kind of looking for people who were talking about this stuff. It led me to, to you and to Simone Brown and to Frank Pasquale and to Sophia Noble and, and all these people. And I had enough conversations with them that eventually I sort of started to have more conversations yeah. with them. And here I am. Yes. And I think one area of this wider terrain of tech mediated harm and injustice that you're most well known for is around consumer surveillance tools, specifically Amazon's Ring, but other in that same family of technologies. Um, can you share with us what are some of your biggest concerns around these? Whereas some people focus on state-based surveillance, you're getting at something different that I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things I always go back to is uh, about three or four years ago, a bunch of Amazon employees, engineers, wrote an open letter to Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one engineer said something that sticks with me so clearly. He said, Amazon Ring is incompatible with a free society. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that so much, uh, that resonated so much. I think what people don't understand is the ways that Amazon's need to cover their own behind mm -hmm. with, um, in terms of package stuff, you know, previously they would be on the hook for it. Mm -hmm. But now 
they've added a layer of surveillance across the entire country. And um, now they're not, but we're all paying for that. Yeah. And so I think about that. I, it, it falls under what I call luxury surveillance. Luxury right? surveillance. The yeah. extent mm -hmm. to which um, privileged people adopt and even sometimes demand mm -hmm. items that are surveillance. But what uh, downstream or sort of not even necessarily downstream, but what immediate effects that has on the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And so just as an example, uh, in the uh, events during the, the uh, protests um, of the movement for black lives um, during and after or after the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. in California, the police uh, asked for all the footage of um, those protests from anyone who had a ring doorbell. And I think about what um, Salinger and Hartzog talk about in terms of obscurity, like the ability just for us to go about our day, to associate with whom we want, to worship, to seek health care, mm. to do, all, you know, to have um, any kind of recreational activities, to do all those things. Ideally, in this society, we're supposed to be able to do those things without harassment. Mm -hmm. and, and that includes protests, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and devices like that render that, which is supposed to be foundational mm -hmm. in our society, they render it um, impossible and dangerous mm -hmm. and, and, and really fraught in ways that I don't think a lot of people understand yeah. Yeah. or are willing to reckon with. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, recently, um, all of us, many of us uh, heard about, if not actually watched, the video um, of Memphis police officers um, beating Tyree Nichols to death. The footage was captured by a camera on a light pole that is part of uh, this network of surveillance tools um, developed by a company called Skycop in Memphis, 2,100 monitored cameras embedded throughout the city. And so if you go to the company's website, Skycop uh, says, it's a finely targeted system that identifies disturbances, helps track perpetrators and identifies crime spot, hotspots efficiently so law enforcement can intervene. So how should we make sense of technologies like Skycop marketed as crime fighting tools that are then taken up and lauded by the public as a way to expose police violence. That is, it seems to be used for good in this case. Yeah, this is really thorny. Uh, you know, a, a part of how I think about it is police body camps, yeah. you know, yeah. and where what, what spawned the movement to um, adopt police body camps. Yeah. And it's very difficult because we can cite instances in which they did a thing they were supposed to, that they some that there was a measure of accountability that comes from that. Yeah. We can cite those. Mm -hmm. um, but there are far more instances of what we've seen, and first of all, I should say it, the empirical work. Yeah. And I've read a lot of it. I can't say I've read all of it. Yeah. I've probably read most of yeah. it. The empirical work does not say that it increases accountability. Yeah. It does not. Yeah. Um, because what we've seen is a big part of what happens is it becomes a debate or a discussion over control of that imagery. Yeah. Um, we've seen that law enforcement has learned how to navigate that, whether that's... Uh, turning it off at, um, um, or citing a malfunction at certain times yeah. or, um, you know, whether that's municipalities um, deciding when to re release the footage, to yeah. whom and how much of it, things like that. Um, you know, in my city, we have a thing called Project Greenlight, yeah. which is, um, it's very hard to explain for people who've never seen it, but there are um, green flashing sirens on apartment buildings and um, restaurants and fast food places and hotels. And if in some areas of the city, you can drive down and there's just this array. Now, they don't, there's no noise, mm -hmm. but they are flashing green sirens. Mm -hmm. They just constantly go. Um, the 
where that came out of is in Detroit post bankruptcy mm -hmm. or during the bankruptcy and, and post bankruptcy, the stated police policy was that unless someone was actively breaking down your door, mm -hmm. when you called 911, they may or may not show up. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, I, I can't, I'm not seeing everyone's face. It might be hard for you to believe. Mm -hmm. Catch me afterwards and I'll give you documentation. Mm -hmm. But it's, this is true. They're, that was their stated policy. Part of Project Greenlight was to tell people, for instance, party store owners, mm -hmm. that if you got Project Green, if you got a green light mm -hmm. with the siren, or not the siren, but with yeah, with the, with the light mm -hmm. and the camera that feeds to a fusion center downtown, if you got green light, you would get prioritized response. Mm -hmm. So that if you bought into the surveillance program, they would come, mm -hmm. and if you didn't. Maybe they would, and maybe they would. What's it? What's the? What's the Fusion Center for those? Oh, the Fusion Center is the headquarters downtown, where all of the uh, feeds go into. Um, it is occasionally sometimes it's watched by human beings, much more often um, processed by artificial intelligence. In some cases, not watched by either, mm -hmm. um, but often has facial recognition attached to it. Um, there's a whole history of that. Uh, I mean, being from Detroit, I'm where two of the three very high profile cases of um, facial recognition falsely implicating black men mm -hmm. who were then arrested yeah. on the say so of, of, the, of the algorithm. Yeah. Um, and so it's a very hard question yeah. um, because there is people want to. Um, feel safe. They want to have a sense of accountability yeah. from these institutions. It seems like these things are doing that. Yeah. I know it often feels like these things are doing that. Yeah. There are isolated instances in which they do. But overall, I think they don't. But I also think they do some very harmful things yeah. in addition. Yeah, this is a related question, and it gets at this idea that we often hear as part of our collective common sense that the tool is not good or bad. It just depends on how you use it. You know, you've heard that idea that depending on who's using it to what ends, that that's what we should evaluate, not the tool itself. And I'm thinking in particular in viral justice about an app called Citizen that I write about, uh, uh, originally called Vigilante to give you a sense of their rebranding when they got some backlash against that. And, you know, this is part of what we might think of as attempts to democratize surveillance. So it's not simply in the hands of law enforcement. If you go to Citizen's website, it says that it's about, it says connect and live more safely. Citizen is a personal safety network that empowers you to protect yourself and the people and places you care about. Download for access to real-time 911 alerts, instant help from crisis responders, and safety tracking for friends and family. So in that same kind of vein that we were talking about, again, it's a, it's a difficult um, issue to think about who's in control. What do we say to those who are being marketed, that is all of us, this kind of surveillance for the people? this branding of these tools as something all of us can download and be part of. Yeah. So, and this gets at a question I hope to, mm -hmm. that we can go have a yeah. back and forth on. Um, but there's a recent story. Um, yes. So in response to a lot of the hate crimes against Asian folks, yep. um, a lot of uh, Chinese elders have started using citizen. Yeah. Um, and they, and they find they, the people they talk to for the story, find it very helpful. Yeah. And, you know, just to go back on Citizen a little bit before yeah. we go forward, um, I have a hard time believing that the person who created this thing is, is what his goal is, is to help people. And one of the reasons I say that mm -hmm. is um, he's a very bombastic sort. Mm -hmm. And the, during the California wildfires, he falsely implicated a person, essentially put a bounty on his head. Um, now, thankfully, he was not harmed. Yeah. But he, I, and, and I, 
I don't remember the exact amount of money. Yeah. It might have, it was 10 or $20,000 or something like that. It was a significant amount of money yeah. for most of us. And he essentially put the bo- a bounty on the head of the wrong person. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's done some other things um, along those lines. And so, but it's very hard because um, one way, so one way I think about it is the institutions that are supposed to serve us yeah. and in many cases protect and serve us, right, are not doing that. Yeah. And so what people, I think, I mean, you, talk, you definitely talk about this in the book, the ways that, a way that people have felt like they needed to, to um, respond to this yeah is by privatizing those things. Mm-hmm. Citizens also pitch the idea of private police forces. Mm-hmm. Like you can essentially click on an app and have someone show up with a gun to your, whatever your thing is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I even go back and think about Marie Van Britten Brown, right? Mm-hmm. Who invented, mm-hmm. who laid the groundwork for all the things that we now understand as home security systems. Yeah. Black woman. Yeah, black woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, black woman. Yeah. Laid the ground for all of that. Yeah. Because the uh, institutions that she felt were not serving her, she thought this technology would would um, do that. Yeah. You know, police response times was the thing. Yeah. That's the thing with Project Greenlight. Yeah. And, you know, we can see it all in all these other places. Um, there are black communities in Baltimore who advocated for a, a spy plane to fly across the city, taking pictures of everyone. Yeah. Um, there are black communities in, in Jackson who um, have bought into a, a, a program where they have video doorbells that, mm-hmm. again, feed all um, that the doorbell in Jazz mm-hmm. into a fusion center yeah. because they don't feel served and they don't feel safe. And so these are the things that they've adopted. And that, I mean, so can I ask you a question, right? Because like, this is, I have, um, this is a a thing I I butt up against Mm -hmm. often Mm -hmm. because, you know, I know you do tons of outreach and community work. Uh, I do as well. And so people need, they need something. They often feel that the technology is going to fill the void or perform the service that they're not getting. And I have to be very careful when I say what I'm about to say. I don't think it is. But like part of my guiding ethos is that communities should be the ones who 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 get to define what they need. Mm -hmm. And so how do you navigate that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I personally think about it in terms of this kind of short term, long term, like if our options are worse and worser, then I understand why people choose worse. (laughs) And so part of my responsibility and I feel obligation is to help us think beyond those two choices. (laughs) So to say what options are not on the table that we're not even allowed to imagine and think about and try to experiment with. Why are we caught between these two choices? One example that I write about in Race After Technology um, is ankle monitors as a solution to overcrowded prisons and jails and thinking about how that's pitched to us as a more humane version of carcerality. You get to wander about, but that just means a more expanded net, carceral net. And there are people who've actually experienced it that say, it brings a whole host of new kind of punitive practices. It's not a solution to the in- inhumanity of being caged in a cell. And so part of it is, is to really push past the, the marketing of these t- two bad choices and to think, okay, what would a, a wholly different approach to these problems look like? And to develop that in community, but not to assume that community is any pure space from which the best solutions are just waiting to be plucked. Community right. is something that we, we think together, we experiment and imagine together in community, and in doing so, try to move beyond these two choices that n- neither of which we had a hand in developing, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that's the starting point, I think. And we see so many wonderful examples of 
people doing this kind of work that is saying, here's a third option, a fourth option to think about what is true safety beyond policing and prisons, you know, and to think about what do we have to grow in addition to what do we need to topple down and bring down? And that is abolition, abolere, to destroy, to grow. What are we going to grow in the process? And fortunately, there are many different prototypes and examples and and efforts underway that we can look to for inspiration and to build on. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, any policy SPIA students in the room? Show of hands. All right. So I see a few. You know, I often think about now in this last few minutes um, before we open things up, thinking about the way forward. We've sort of given you a taste of the problem space, some of the conundrums and tensions. So what do we do about it? And there are big buckets of ways to begin to think about this. You know, for me, obviously, thinking about education and training um, as a ground zero for how do we develop new ideas and approaches. So that's definitely one book, bucket we could think of as pedagogy and education. One is in terms of organizing both within tech. There's lots of wonderful organizing within the tech industry. Um, one particular um, hashtag, tech won't build it, of tech workers thinking about the, the, the limits to what they will do and building with community organizers in community, many of which you are, you are in, in touch with in Detroit. Um, and then there's also policy and legislation and protections. And I know in 2019, you testified before the House Financial Services Committee. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit of what that experience was like and your views about the role of policy in this broader struggle over tech-mediated harms. Yeah, it was a really interesting experience <laughs> to see how yeah. some of the sausage gets made. <laughs> I mean, one thing I will say is, um, so my, my daytime gig, um, up until I received this fellowship that I'm currently on, my daytime gig is community college professor. Yeah. And so one of the things I didn't know about the whole process for testifying, the span in which they invited me, I had to produce a, a, a text for the record, and I testified maybe eight days. Okay? And so most people have teams, you know? They have... Um, grad assistants and uh, receptionists and uh, like all these things. They have, stu- you know, students who are going to work on it for them. Yeah. And I had just had me. And so, and even there's no financial support. No. So I had to put my own bill to DC wow. to stay, you know, and all of that. And I, I realized how much work goes into just being hurt. Yes. You know, um, and that was, that in itself was so interesting. But the other thing is I think, Tech has had kind of a free reign yeah. for at least 25 years. Uh, I mean, the example I, I often use is if we think about food, mm-hmm. right? If I opened a restaurant and I had some new kind of food and I poisoned everybody the day I opened, yeah, I can't just open the day after that and say, now I'm poisoning 20% fewer people. Mm-hmm. But tech does that every day, right? <laughs> like, all the time. They're, they're currently doing it. And so I think that we have to get, they've done a tremendous job of hoisting a narrative upon us that we have to accept the poison, Mm -hmm. right? The harms, the surveillance, like everything, that we have to accept the poison if we want these things that um, supposedly give us some benefit. Yes. And and sometimes do. I should not diminish it in that way. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. We can have many of these things without the poison. I mean, some of these things are just poison. Mm -hmm. 100% and we mm-hmm. shouldn't, in my estimation, shouldn't have them. Yeah. But we have to get, I think it's so important that the frameworks that we've developed for how to have, how to live in a society yeah. that we apply to food and medicine yeah. and other technologies like automobiles and yeah. all these other things. But in the, in certain areas of tech, we've just said, oh, we, you know, innovation and we just keep moving. Yeah. I've heard Kathy O'Neill say we need an FDA for technologies yeah, yeah. before you roll them out. <laughs> it has to go through a rigorous process. Right. right. Scrutiny. Yeah. So for the next generation of tech justice organizers, scholars, artists in the room, um, how do you see the problems we currently face evolving? How would you encourage them to approach their work, to think about what's before them? Uh well, it, I mean, some of it happens upon what you said earlier, right? Um, well, a lot of it. I mean, so you said imagination is a contested field. Yeah. And so I think that there's been 
a big part of it is whose imagination are we putting into practice, right? Um, and so much of what we have now comes from what, you know, a small group of funders think is going to make money. Yeah. And so even if we take something like search, right, and chat and Bard and whatever meta is now releasing one, mm -hmm. no one, I mean, no one's clamoring for a search that confidently gives you a bunch of wrong answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, Google's bad enough as it is. Like, no one's clamoring for that. Yet, there are a small group of investors who are confident that this will make them a bunch of money, mm -hmm. so the rest of us get stuck with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we have to alter that relationship that tech just gets foisted upon us because of the curtailed imagination of a limited number of people. Yeah. Um, but also, we do need to figure out, um, talk to the people who are most going to be affected by these things yeah. and figure out what they want. And, yeah. You know, because there's so much top down yeah. with all of this. Yeah. You yeah. mentioned funding um, and you are on a fellowship, which you hinted at, but I w would love as we open things up. Now you can, if you want to ask a question, sort of raise your hand and they'll bring a mic to you. But as we, in, in that transition, maybe you can tell them what this Tech Justice Fellowship is and yeah. <laughs> who's behind it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yes, that's I thought, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm a Just Tech Fellow. Yeah. I'm a part of the inaugural cohort yeah. um, um, funded by the Social Science Research Council. And yeah. I mean, it's been, as I mentioned before, I mean, my, my daytime job, I used to describe myself as privacy Batman because like, during the day, Batman. right? Yeah, during the day, I taught classes. I teach yeah. four classes a semester. Yeah. And then at night, I would do the writing and the talking yes. and things like that. But, Tweeting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but this has allowed me to, to just focus on yeah. this work. Yeah. And it's been amazing. Like, I can't say enough good things about it. That um, part of the as I understand it, part of the whole reason for the fellowship existing is to give people who are doing this work the time and space to do it in a really dedicated yeah, way. Exactly. So. Um, and it's, yeah, I, it's been outstanding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Let's open things up. Hear from you. Um, I'm here all the time. And you can take my classes and come to my office hours. So maybe in the few minutes we have, we can prioritize questions for Professor Gilliard. And I might chime in, but that's where we'll focus our attention. Please. Hi. This opportunity um, in this conversation, I really appreciate it. Um, my question is about the concept of technology, AI in particular, and really thinking about algorithms and influence when it comes to the concept of justice. Um, there are studies, and there's actually been a news article as well, about AI taking the place of lawyers and serving in the role as protecting defendants or serving legal action in lieu of a human. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the implications of that, specifically when it comes to justice, particularly Black justice. Oh, gosh. I So um, I'm actually working on a piece called AI is Never Going to Be Woke. <laughs> <laughs> um, because... So there's so many different ways to approach this. But what I would tell you is that rich people are not going to have AI lawyers. Rich people are not going to have AI doctors. Rich people are not going to have AI therapists. Um, you know, if you, uh, so Sam Altman, who I think is the CEO of OpenAI, tweeted recently mm -hmm. about um, how ChatGPT was going to be a tutor for people. And it was going to be a therapist for people. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, if you follow these conversations and read Ruhas House work, I mean, you know that these, um, even if you don't and you understand that these systems were trained on the bulk of the Internet. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be super toxic. They are. OK, like they are. And there's I mean, there's a, an, a sort of associated discussion with a lot of these funders and things who are complaining about AI already yeah. being too woke. Because they can't make it be racist enough. Yeah. So, 
I have serious doubts about the ability of these technologies to confer a degree of justice to people. I, I think, you know, simply I would pay attention to who's saying, who's telling us that it's going to do that. And if they're first in line to have that AI lawyer or AI surgeon or AI therapist, they're probably not. And that's a good indication of what they think we deserve and what they think they deserve. Oh, thank you. Hi, thank you both so much for um, for your talk and for your conversation. Um, you mentioned a little bit ways that you think people can get involved in tech justice and kind of what you see as the bigger picture of um, like changing the paradigm around how we use technology. Um, I was just wondering, I guess like for people who see themselves in kind of like the political world and the activist world, but not specifically focused on tech justice. What do you see as like the ways that we can incorporate tech justice in kind of our everyday tasks and how we can incorporate tech justice in the other types of activism that we do? Yeah, that is a really important question. Thank you for asking that. Um, if you don't know my background, I'm actually an English professor. And so I'm not a, a technologist in the pure sense that many people think. Um, what I would say, what I always say is that we're all experts in our own lives, in our own experiences. And because these systems touch on so many different, I mean, all at this point, all aspects of our lives, it's important for us to recognize that as a kind of expertise. Yeah. So I think part of the project by technologists has been to tell us that we're not experts on the technology that if you don't know how to code, you don't have anything to say about this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very deliberate um, process and action that's meant to make us be quiet. Um, but we are all experts in, in sort of our experiences, mm -hmm. which is the thing that um, that input is what's lacking from so many of the technologies that are foisted upon us. And so I might... My short answer is we, you don't have to learn, you don't have to learn how to code or you don't have to even that understanding how these things are impacting you, how things might impact you, what you need, what your community needs, what your family needs, that's expertise as well. And I think we have to keep that in the forefront. Yeah. And I would just add, you know, to think whatever your area of organizing is, a starting point is to think about how technology is impacting that for good or bad. So you're working in housing justice. There are all kinds of property technologies that are developed from the, the developers and the landlord's point of view, what they want to get out of it. And so in that space, you have something like an anti-eviction mapping project that's organizer based, that's thinking about how to give everyday renters and people the tools to be able to think about the, the ways they're being harmed by these technologies and similarly in healthcare. So it's thinking about how technology cross cuts with whatever your area of, of organizing or activism is and starting there for what's most relevant and impacting the people on the ground. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Um, hello, my name is Mutemwa. Um, if you saw me at any point standing in the back, mm -hmm. now you know the name of the cool guy you saw standing in the back. Um, <laughs> I really appreciated the conversation, and something that really struck me was the conversation about abolition specifically, um, because I think, especially you know, as a student and someone who's going to go out into the the world as the next generation leader, there's almost like um, myself and the other students here, not just okay. me, um, but there's a certain um, amount of bravery you have to build to be able to speak up because sometimes it comes at the risk of your image. Sometimes it's at the risk of your career, your livelihood, and several different issues. And the tech industry is like big names, you know, like, you know, Bill Gates. And, you know. Um, so I'm just curious to know um, how someone can build their voice and advocate for themselves and their needs, even given the risks that sometimes come with the work that you do. Yeah. Cool. Um. That might be the most difficult question. Um, I, uh, I mean, so a lot of how I did mine was through social media, but I can't exactly advocate that as a method um, for a lot of reasons. Um, 
I, I mean, I'm kind of stumped. I mean, there, I, I, so I realize the reality of what you are saying. A part of it, again, is, is what Professor Benjamin has said, is the collective aspect of yeah. it. So that, uh, to draw a concrete example, I think the layoffs um, were part of a massive pushback by capital against labor. Mm-hmm. That um, in many cases, tech and tech workers in their organizing and speaking out, unionizing, I think have has been like a, the layoffs in some ways were a response to that, the pushback against that power, mm-hmm. um, which means it's very threatening. And so a way I would advocate is by finding other folks who are like-minded, who are willing to also do that work and speak out. Um, to be a singular individual in a room, you know, in a boardroom, on a project, things like that, mm-hmm. um, it, in many cases, it's going to be, um, I mean, you might even be willing to speak up and take whatever slings and arrows come your way, but often, though, that's, it's not going to move the needle. Yeah. Like, it's only going to move the needle through um, a more collective response. Yeah. And I, I would just add, too, there are efforts underway to create protections for individuals to be able to speak out. In California in 2021, after the advocacy of uh, three black women who were uh, laid off and who had signed non-disclosure agreements, um, they took it to court and eventually a bill was pa- a law was passed called the Silence No More uh, Act, which protects people, especially if they're speaking out against any racial or gender discrimination, that that non-disclosure agreement doesn't apply. And so that's in one state, but thinking about what that would look like in, on, a, on a broader level, I think, um, is important. And also to recognize with this work, there's going to be risk involved, no matter how many laws and policies you, um, you pass. Close to home for me, I've been following the story of a dean at the University of Houston School of Social Work who was bringing an abolitionist approach to social work because more and more people are realizing that the system of child protective services is really about family regulation and is deeply racist in its practice and its origins. And so he's bringing an abolitionist approach to social work and his colleagues didn't like it. He was doing things that were a little too radical. And what they did was they demoted him back down to the faculty. And so when I heard that, I was like, that is a career goal. I want to be demoted um, because I've done something so obnoxious to for my colleagues who think it's, you know. And so but in that story, we see that no matter what your level of seniority or your accomplishment, there is still an element of risk that people will decide, no, you've gone too far and we're going to put you back in your place. And so it's just something to, to recognize it's part of the terrain in which we work, you know. Sorry, I was in the corner. Uh, Thank you so much for your commentary. My name is Hannah. I'm a senior and I'm actually writing my senior thesis on a tech policy issue. Um, My question for you is several of these tech justice issues kind of strike right at the heart of several of our civil liberties. I'm thinking Section 230 Mm -hmm. and a lot of things that new advancement is challenging, things that we've taken for granted for so long. So how can we take a proactive approach to addressing tech justice, especially when they come into tension with things like freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Can uh, um, I ask you, can I ask you, um, can you say a little bit more, please? Yeah. (laughs) So one thing I've observed, and maybe I'm completely wrong, is that many issues we see with algorithms and the pace of development, right, they come completely in tension with questions of regulation. So I'm thinking Section 230. 
we don't know how we can control the actions of these companies, how they can regulate their content rec recommendation algorithms. But at the same time, we know that some of these harms that are happening, uh, like hate speech, for example, are very problematic and they've been completely exacerbated by technological development. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is interesting. Um, and again, harkening back to what uh, Ruha said at the beginning, none of this is new. Okay. It's just like a, a algorithmic veneer over everything. And so if you take, you know, um, if you, if you take chat GPT as an example, so, you know, it, I mean, this is, I'm being mildly sarcastic, but the day before you released it, if you had talked to me and, and Ruha and Joan Donovan and, you know, a bunch of other people said, write down what's going to happen, notarize it, you know, seal it, open it two weeks from, from now. We all would have been correct, right? And I mean, I don't have like special insight. I mean, I read a lot about this stuff, but there's nothing special about me. Like we all knew this would happen. And so a, a thing, a narrative that companies have been very um, successful at crafting is that you have to set something out into the world, mm -hmm. see the harm that it does, mm -hmm. and then perhaps address some of it afterwards. That is, this is not true. Mm -hmm. So, and, and further, even if they didn't know what was going to happen, that's a case of a very willful ignorance on their part. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, you know, and we can even see this in their own research. If you look at Facebook's research about hate speech, if you look at Instagram's research about body image, mm -hmm. they have people inside who are telling them these things. They know. So if they don't know, it's because they don't want to know. And if they haven't acted on it, <laughs> it's because they don't want to act on it. The, the, a key thing I think that is so important to remember is that these policies, practices, discriminatory effects, all these things are not new. There are things that we've been dealing with for a long time with a technological screen over. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at it that way, there's no, we didn't know. It's only kind of what harms they're willing to put out on people and see what they could get away with. I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm very animated about this because like that is a, it's a key, uh, thing that that these companies do is to say well there's no way to anticipate the harms but there are all kinds of folks right Commu people in the community like academics attorney like all these there are people who know who could absolutely tell you what's going to happen and in many cases have warned these companies you know i think about axon mm -hmm. you know and so axon is the body camera is it, are they still called axon yeah, it's the camera that makes, um, mm -hmm. it's the company that makes body cameras and also tasers. Mm -hmm. And the CEO of the company wanted to release a drone. He wanted to start marketing a drone that in the event of an active shooter in schools would drop out of the ceiling and fly through the corridors and tase the shooter. Wow. He even made a comic book about it. He had a board of academics you know, attorneys, like, you know, activists, to a person, they, and they told him, this is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And most of them wound up resigning because he decided to go through with it anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not currently, it doesn't currently exist because the public backlash was so large that he put it on pause. But just recently, he said that he's still going to go through with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example um, again, and I mean, there's so there's so many examples of their own internal research calling them this. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, I think, be very wary when companies say there was no way of knowing about X, Y or Z, because very often that is not the case. And the other thing I would add for a project like that is to when we think about what's possible or not and when these different sort of principles are seem to be at odds is to look outside of the U.S. context for comparative cases, that the very same companies operating in different countries are miraculously able to put in place certain protections 
that are not required here. One in example might be Germany, where somehow they're able to filter out anti-Semitic speech online and still operate because German law requires it. So when they say, oh, everything will implode if we do X, Y, and Z here in terms of our liberties and speech, we can see that they're able to enforce certain protections, the same platforms. Another sort of footnote to that is just last week, Germany a uh, German constitutional court um, made predictive policing um, tools outlawed those in Germany, that tools that had been um, piloted by Palantir, which operates free and clear here in the U.S., adopted by ICE, immigration enforcement, policing. And there finally, after a few years that were just being rolled out, it's now not constitutional. So I think in our research, I think it's good to have sort of comparative cases and to think cross-nationally about how certain regulatory frameworks um, uh, push back against the laissez-faire approach of tech that we see happening here. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Sir? Hi. So uh, some of the recent developments with ChatGPT and I guess... Uh, Bard and Bing and uh, these other technologies have, have come up in a couple of ways. Um, and I was wondering, with these language technologies in particular, what are sort of the concrete ways that you see these things causing the most harm in the next year or two down the line? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, um, in my field, I mean, so much of it has unfortunately been concentrated on plagiarism. Mm -hmm which in my humble opinion is not like a major thing to worry about. Yeah. Um, a couple of things I think about are the lowering of the barrier for massive disinformation campaigns, mm -hmm. like flooding, you know, um, con uh, Congress or, you know, flooding your local representative or whoever with what seems to be, you know, organic information, mm -hmm. but it's just like, a, you know, Al, you know, sort of algorithmically uh, generated massive amounts of disinformation. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I urge the people to think about as, as a writer and as someone who teaches writing is there's been so much to come out uh, that has come out which claims it can um, do the messy work of writing for you. You know, people are using it on dating profiles and people are using it to generate first drafts and people are using it to write screenplays and things like mm -hmm. that. And I, I think that there's a very important element of humanity that comes from our relationship to writing things down. Mm -hmm. It helps us um, figure out what we think. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, so just as an example, I urge everyone to think about whether it was journaling or having to write a paper or a letter or what it was. And that part where there's, there's a, a moment where you're not sure what you think or you haven't fully experienced it or fleshed it out until you actually write about it. Mm -hmm. And most of us have had some kind of experience like that or even working collaboratively on a project with someone. And that, um, that interplay, like, which is often very messy by design, I think it needs to be, it helps us figure out what we think, what we know, who we are. Mm -hmm. I think seeding that to a machine that's been trained on a very toxic space, mm -hmm. um, I think is a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, I can't say, <laughs> I think you use the word concrete, maybe. Harm. I mean, I can't directly say you will be harmed in this way by mm -hmm. this, but I think it makes, I think it will, it, it takes away something human from us, right? That the difference between writing a poem and having J chat BT, GPT write a poem mm -hmm. is very significant. Um, but I think it's a thing we won't understand that we've lost mm -hmm. until we stop doing it. And, and I hope that doesn't come, but those are two examples. Thank you. Thank you all. First, please, everyone, just join me in thanking our speakers for a great conversation.
Uh, my name is Brian Blunt. I'm an assistant dean in the Office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students, and I want to ex continue to extend that sense of gratitude beyond our speakers to my colleagues in Otis who helped coordinate this, our partners in Campus Venue Services who helped us have the space, our Caterer Business Bistro, and obviously all of you who made this a standing room only affair. I apologize to those who had to um, watch from uh, the wings. Um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping as we close out, again, our first focus program of the year is that there will be a reception to follow. So you'll be welcome to sort of stay, enjoy some refreshments and mix and mingle. Uh, for students, we have copies of Professor Benjamin's book, and I know that she'll join them for a little bit as, um, as we distribute those. Uh, students, if there are those of you who, um, I, I don't know exactly how many of you are here, but if there are a couple extras, you can sign up with Otis and we'll follow up with you afterwards. Um, but again, just wanted to thank everyone for your time this afternoon. I um, hope you enjoyed the event. And um, if you are interested in more events like this, you can visit the Otis Focus website and um, see what we have scheduled coming up. Thank you.